The Communion of Saints is a series that seeks to share information on the life and times of the saints of the Catholic Church. Your program hosts are Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle. Hello and welcome to Communion of Saints. I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jack Lavelle. Now today we're going to talk about St. Norbert. Uh, some people may have heard of the saint. Uh, I would venture to say that many people probably are very unfamiliar mm -hmm. with St. Norbert. So let's give uh, a little background as to uh, when he was born and where he was born. Well, as his name might sound for most people, he was born in Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, he was born in the year 1080. And one of the interesting things about him is, uh, you know, as we look at vocations today, uh, sadly, one of the biggest stumbling blocks to a vocation is the family. You know, the parents want their child to get married. They want him to have a family. They want him to give them grandchildren. What's interesting about Norbert is that his family wanted him mm -hmm. to become an ordained priest. He fought that uh, desire in his family. And yet we hear a story about how one day in a storm he's riding on the horse and he is knocked off and um, whatever else is part of that experience from there he then starts to reevaluate his life and he seeks to be ordained and is actually ordained a priest at the age of 35. What's interesting also is uh, as you were talking uh, immediately what came to mind was uh, the feast of the conversion of St. Paul. You know we have that biblical account of how he was uh, struck. Uh, oftentimes legend says that he was on a horse. Uh, of course that's never in the biblical passage but we always picture that. But there's that sense that that, that was a moment of his conversion. And so there was something dramatically that happened. But oftentimes uh, in our own uh, life of conversion and change, that's not always so dramatic. Um, and, I, and I venture to say that many people kind of look for a dramatic um, voice of God or something earth shattering that's going to tell them this is what they should do or this is uh, how they should live their life. But oftentimes the Lord speaks to us in more quiet and in simple ways. Uh, and there's a difference there when someone is receiving that message that's so profound, but that is just so rare when it happens. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. When I talk to some people about their vocations, very, very rarely is it one of those grand, you know, conversions that life was so desolate and they were, you know, doing this or doing that. And then the next thing you know, there's this great revelation, you know, where the earth shakes and the stars move. You know, I would say for most people, it is a gradual awareness of their gifts and talents, but usually it is other people's recognition. And so, what I would say in Norbert is that he probably is the companion, they come together. Maybe there was this, this grand storm and, and he's knocked off his horse, but it was already something that was gradually being planted by his family. And it can't be that they thought he was a horrible person, so let's send him to the seminary. They must have recognized some gifts and characteristics and traits in him. And I think that translates to our current age where sometimes we don't recognize that ourselves. Other people will perhaps say to a young person, you know, you're, you're very kind, you're very loving, you're very charitable. Have you ever thought that maybe this is what God is calling you to do? It's interesting because once he has this profound conversion or change or uh, this discernment has finally taken place that he's going to enter the priesthood, he devotes really the rest of his his life and priesthood uh, to penance, devotion, uh, prayers to Our Lady. So there's a whole sense that, that he becomes uh, almost uh, extremely spiritual mm -hmm. in, his, uh, in his priesthood and in his uh, uh, ministerial life. Um, that doesn't always mean that, that every priest spends their life in, in penance and constant devotion and prayer, but that was what his life was like. And that probably was something that, as you mentioned, was instilled in him through his family, especially if his family desired, above all, for their son to become a priest. Uh, we know that he um, uh, uh, started the Norbertines, 
uh, a religious community, and that he died uh, in 1134 in Germany. Uh, however, his mortal remains are in Prague. Uh, we're not quite sure why that is. Um, we also know that he gave uh, his possessions to the poor, and so probably through this life of devotion and penance, uh, he saw the need to reach out to the poor. And oftentimes we see that in the lives of people uh, that were blessed, uh, people who were wealthy, that were saints throughout their life, that they give their possessions, in a sense, back to God through the poor. Uh, why does that uh, happen so often and why is that so important for us to be uh, people who remember the poor and the needy? Well, I think certainly it becomes a response of, of recogni recognizing God's grace in our own lives and so you, you recognize your brothers and sisters. One of those great things of being called to faith is that it's not me, it's not just my own personal journey that it is us together. And so you become more aware of those on the journey with you who are less fortunate. And perhaps one of the things with Norbert, why there would have been this great desire to then give things to the poor is, as his family was speaking to him prior to his conversion, we have to assume that in those quiet moments after his conversion, before the Blessed Sacrament, in devotion to Our Lady, that he continued to hear those voices, perhaps not as we've spoken of Fatima or Lourdes, but that in those quiet moments of prayer, in that um, adoration before the Blessed Sacrament, he's hearing the voice of God invite him to become generous, to become caring, to become more compassionate. And so that renouncement of, of all of his possessions to help those who are in great need would certainly become a charism and a hallmark of his, his ordination and then his priesthood for the next 19 years. We know that he uh uh, was canonized by Pope Gregory the uh, Thirteenth almost uh, 400 years after his ordination to the priesthood. Uh, we celebrate his feast uh, on June 6th. Uh, what could we learn more about the life of someone who dedicates uh, themselves to God, especially in the priesthood, in this day and age where we have fewer and fewer vocations? Isn't it more of a call to those um, who may not uh, really have discerned a call to the priesthood, but whose family may be extremely supportive of having a vocation or nurturing a vocation to kind of be aware of that as an option within their life? Certainly, and I think what Norbert's life is calling people in this current age is to be willing to listen to others, to take their compliments you know, uh, one of the things in our current society is um, we get very shy about people telling us we're good at something. We automatically dismiss it. Someone says, oh, that's the best dinner. Oh, no, no, I just threw it together. Take the compliments of people looking at your life and recognizing love and compassion and care and concern. But not only take the compliments, but see how that might be propelling you to a, a different way of life and at least be open to the discernment of a vocation in the church. We're gonna talk about another holy saint in a moment. Stay with us, we'll be right back. There is a place where a total stranger will give you their blood. There is a place where someone you never knew will save your child from drowning. A place where people from seven states away will turn up at your door and give you food and shelter after a flood. There's a place where a person who doesn't look like you, talk like you, or dress like you, will stretch out their hand and put it across your shoulders and say, everything is going to be okay. That place is called America, where we look out for each other, and it's up to us to keep it that way. When you help the American Red Cross, you help America. I am Marinol. Yo soy Marinol. Marinol, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Missioners, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Marinol. I'm Father Mike. And I am Mary 
I am Marino. 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 Welcome back to our show. Now we're going to talk about Saint Aloysius Gonzaga. Uh, what's interesting about his uh, own life journey is that he has been mentored by other people that we call saints in the Catholic Church. And we're gonna talk a little bit uh, more about that and their influence on him. But let's kind of set the stage and talk about uh, where he was born and a little bit about his background prior to his ordination. Well, he was born in Italy to a, a noble family. And uh, what we know about his um, his family's desire for him, at least his father's, is that his father wanted him to become a soldier. Um, so perhaps he was not the firstborn in this family. In a noble family, you would always want the firstborn is going to carry on uh, with the title and with the, the wealth and the prestige. But his father wanted him to be a soldier. And oftentimes we see that in some of these noble families that um, if you have more than one child, one carries on the legacy, one might be involved in, in military, one might be involved in some aspect of government. Um, it really is down the chain, if you will, in some of these families that they might consider uh, a child going to a convent or uh, to the seminary. And we know though that at the age of 10, at a young age, this boy whose father is trying to push him in another direction, he consecrates himself to God. And even at the age of 10, he takes on a vow of virginity. And so what that is saying is that he is desiring, even at that young age, he wants to keep himself pure. He wants to completely devote himself to God. Whether at the age of 10 he understood what that vow meant, it really was less about you know, virginity and more about not allowing other relationships to deter him from having that most important relationship with God. Uh, we know that he was schooled uh, in the Jesuit order, uh, was mentored by St. Robert Bellarmine, uh, but prior to that, at the age of 12, he received Holy Communion, his first Holy Communion uh, from St. Charles Borromeo. And so there's this whole sense that these uh, lives of the saints are really intertwined. And doesn't that say something about how uh, the church really is uh, a large family? that there's this uh, uh, intertwining, this interdependence that really becomes part of who we are as church. And, you know, we talk about the lives of the saints uh, on our show, but we really are united with them in many ways, uh, not only through uh, historically their life here on earth, but also at some point, hopefully spiritually uh, with our lives with them in heaven. And so what does that say about our relationship with the saints in general. Well, certainly, as you said, that, that beautiful family, and to remember that we are a faith-filled family from generation to generation. And, you know, while we remember stories of, of great-grandparents or we've actually experienced relationships with grandparents, um, and, and that becomes part of who we are, it shapes us, you know. Um, a gift or a talent or a skill that a grandmother might have had, people will look at us and say, oh, you're just like your grandmother, you're just like your grandfather, you know, oh, your grandmother did that just like you do. And to remember that as this family of faith, the same is true of the saints, you know, and that we need to continue to keep them as family members and model ourselves after them. And certainly we would see for Aloysius this um, interaction with Charles Borromeo, and certainly as a noble family, they would have, been part of, of, of church life as well. And so Charles Borromeo uh, gives him his first Eucharist. Uh, and then to have other holy people mentor him, such as Robert Bellarmine, you know, it, it just reminds us again of that beauty of faith and not to just allow it, as, as treasured as it is with those who we are related to here on earth, but to allow it to expand to those that we are related to across the generations in our family of faith. Uh, we know, as we had mentioned, uh, that St. Robert Bellarmine was really his spiritual director, his mentor uh, in the life of the church and, and in his own faith development. How important is it for us, as an aside, to have someone who kind of guides and directs us spiritually? I know uh, oftentimes as priests we're asked by other people, um, many times our parishioners, to to share and to teach them different things about the Lord and especially to mentor them in their spiritual life. 
But let's uh, briefly talk about that whole um, virtue of being a spiritual director for someone and what really does that mean? Well, specifically for Aloysius and for anyone who's in seminary studies, and we know that Aloysius um, does not go on to, to ordination, that he is involved in ministry and contracts an illness that he's helping to care for people suffering from, and he dies uh, prior to being ordained. But part of that structure would have been a, a personal spiritual director who would have fostered and guided him. Now, there's a, an official structure in seminary or people in religious life, but for all people, you're right, to seek out that spiritual guidance. It might not be in the formalized manner that it is in, in formation, but uh, to be open to the spiritual movements of the church in our lives. And so many people will come and say, you know, is there something I can read? Is there something I can reflect on? Is there um, the lives of a saint or two that, that could challenge me? And to make that part of a, a personal reflection and to, to learn more and to open oneself up more. And to recognize that all of us then, in the same way, serve as those spiritual directors, mm -hmm. guiding people by our own lives. Maybe not by our copious, you know, writings or or reflections, but just in how we're living our lives each and every day. We know that in 1926, he was named a patron of youth by Pope Pius XI. Uh, that really says something about his own young life, that he would have been an example for the young people, and in particular for young men uh, who might be discerning a call to the priesthood. So there's this whole sense that, that we have those those persons that uh, become examples and patrons for us in the church that we could look to uh, and lift up as an example of someone that we might imitate. Uh, and as you had mentioned uh, before, when you had talked about how some people say, oh, you're like your grandmother, or you do things like this or that, there's that whole sense that it's, it's really um, a compliment uh, mm -hmm. to follow someone uh, who has led an exemplary life or someone who has done uh, good things or good deeds and to emulate them, to follow them. And so certainly uh, Aloysius Gonzaga was one that young people can look up to, uh, not only those who might be discerning a call to the priesthood, but young people in general. Uh, we know that uh, on his uh, deathbed that he had the name of Jesus on his lips. So that was really a beautiful example of how he was prepared uh, as in life, especially in death, to meet his Lord. Uh, we're going to talk about another saint in a moment. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Well, I've been volunteering for 18, almost 20 years for um, volunteer chore service for community, uh, Catholic community services. What I do is help the elderly in their homes so that they can stay in their homes. I do work from shopping to housework to yard work. Most of the people I see don't really have a lot of family, so then I become almost like their family. I think a lot of times the elderly in our society are forgotten. And that's unfortunate because they're a real important part of our community because they have so much wisdom to share. Doing this type of work is very rewarding. You can't put it into words because I learn so much from these people and you learn stuff about yourself too. You learn to see God in a, in a variety of people in a variety of settings. The other day she told me that every night she when she goes to bed, she thinks about her little angel, when her little angel's gonna come and check on her the next day, and that's me, yeah. 33 million Americans have descended into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Welcome back to our show. Now we're going to talk about another saint that uh, I believe is probably as equally uh, obscure as uh, Norbert that we uh, talked about, uh, but not uh, as obscure, but Romuald. So let's talk a little bit about him. Uh, what are some of the surroundings of his life that we might uh, share with the folks that are with us? Well, similar to our last saint, Aloysius, he too is born into a noble family uh, in Ravenna around 950, 951. So in Ravenna, Italy. Uh, one of the interesting things about him is 
that uh, after his father is killed, he has this great desire to go and live with the Benedictine uh, monks. And so we know that he lives in a Benedictine monastery for three years after the death of his father. And while there then is certainly um, welcomed into a community of faith, uh, is able to be part of what we've talked about with the monastic communities, um, to work with them, to pray with them, to share everything in common. And then we know that from there, he moves on uh, not too far to the vicinity of Venice. And he goes beyond this sense of being a monk in the um, Benedictine tradition, and he lives under the direction of a hermit. And we've talked a little bit over uh, the seasons of, of this show, you know, those who have been called to be a hermit, who really become more reclusive in their lives. They really are that sense of separating themselves from all that's going on in the world and really focusing on this deep personal prayer life with God, but always inviting other people's prayer in. It, again, is not that selfish, personal, it's all about me, so I'm going to pray to God, all of my desires and all of my wants, but to remove oneself from all of the trappings of the world, but to bring the prayers of the world together to God in that personal relationship. It's really interesting because oftentimes in our show, we've talked about <laughs> those who have been in the monastic order who were elected bishops uh, or leaders of diocese to leave that order and to go into a diocesan church. And so this is almost kind of the reverse. Mm -hmm. They're going from one uh, consider, considerable larger community to an extremely uh, solitary community. Um, that whole sense of uh, St. Benedict, let's go back to that. That was uh, obviously uh, founded by St. Benedict and uh, the uh, religious women, uh, order through his twin sister Scholastica, but that whole sense of the Benedictine order, there were certain rules and, and procedures and regulations that they lived by, and that was really uh, the beginnings of, the, of monasticism as we know it, and also finding its roots in Italy, and so that country even today continues to be a, an extremely uh, religious country, uh, maybe more nominally than uh, in practicality, but yet that whole sense that it's being nurtured there in this uh, religious country and religious context. And what would have made uh, someone like Romuald want to leave uh, the confines of a community where he was in prayer and work and, and uh, commonality with others to go off by himself? I mean, there, there's got to be some interior um, discernment or something that would have uh, caused him to do that. But also, what was the benefit of being a hermit and what is the benefit of being a hermit in this world today? Well, and I think for him especially, he would have been uh, part of seeking out that, that solitude because of prayer, mm -hmm. because of, of that devotion and that prayer. Now, we don't know the experiences of his, of his family life and whatever he was seeking, you know, to have had his father killed. Um, but what we do know about him is that while he seeks to go from the Benedictine monastery to train or to be prepared uh, under a, the direction of a hermit, is that he then spends the next 30 years of his life traveling. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't just stay in one hermit setting. You know, there is one hermitage where he's, you know, by himself. There's a great irony to his life that he was part of a religious community. He then sought a more solitude life, but then he spends 30 years going around Italy, starting other monasteries and other hermitages. So it really was as if um, he was caught between these two worlds, the monastic community, a larger community of brothers together, um, the more solitude life, but then becomes the conduit by which he allows other people to discern which of those is best for them and establishes these communities um, for 30 years. So there is kind of a, a strangeness to his life that um, maybe it's that he enjoyed aspects of both and then felt the great desire to share that 
with whoever was discerning that in their own life. We know that in the um, second millennium, uh, the year 1012, that he actually uh, created the order of hermits. And so we, we talk about religious orders and communities that they have particular charisms, uh, whether that char charism is to, uh, to teach or to uh, work with the poor or the sick or the suffering. His charism was to spend time in solitary prayer. Mm -hmm. And so there is that, that charism that continues to be available in the life of the church. And we see that charism uh, not only in Romuald's life, but also in the life of the church, how those charisms really benefit the life of the church. And I think we've talked about it in, in other episodes where we really need those people uh, who live life in monasticism, uh, in hermitages, who spend their life in prayer. Because in our rather um, uh, busy life, we don't always have that opportunity to pray. But to know that there are those around us in our world that are praying for us, that are praying for the church, that are praying uh, for justice, that are praying for peace, uh, it's really important for us to kind of uh, depend on them but also to understand that we see them as an example as well, that uh, we may not be called to a life of monasticism or a life of, as a hermit, uh, to live life in solitary, but yet uh, we emulate them by trying to uh, spend some time with the Lord in prayer. And how important in our last uh, few minutes of our, of our show to have that specific prayer life with the Lord. Well, and when you said that, I, I think sometimes words have different connotations. So if we were to say the word hermit to many people, they might think, oh, it's someone who's closed themselves up or, or someone who just isn't able to be around other people, um, whether it's by their choice or, or not. But in the description of what a hermit within the church does, that beautiful prayer, I couldn't help but think in our own parishes that we have, um, we need to continue to value that prayer life and that ministry of prayer and how often it is, not to say left to, but becomes a ministry of those who perhaps are older, who now live alone, perhaps they're widowed, perhaps their children and grandchildren don't live around them. Maybe some infirmities make it difficult for them to get out and to still want them to know that they are still a very vital part of the community and that an essential part of the community is that prayer. And so to remind people that their ministry may have, have shifted over the years. They're no longer working in the cafeteria at the school or volunteering you know, with youth ministry, but now that essential prayer, that they pray for the parish, that they pray for our young people, that they pray for vocations. And so I think the example um, that we see in the official structure of hermits, though not as plentiful as they would have been during the time we're talking about, is still lived out in a beautiful way in every parish, in every community. And we need to elevate that and lift that up. Thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. The Communion of Saints was a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. Your program hosts were Father Jim Corda and Father Jack LaBelle.